last few years, I've been up and down the country championing ambitious restoration projects and the brave heroes who've taken them on. We are saving it, you know, it will be a house and it will last you know, another 300 years. In this series, I'm going back to visit long after the dust has settled. <laughs> Welcome to a different world. <sighs> I want to find out how these spaces work as homes to live in. And it's working really nicely with the old building, isn't it? Restoration is one of the biggest challenges out there. It's too hard, too much to lose, really. But if you get it right, the results can be life-changing. We just didn't want to live in a normal terrace house again. Oh, my God. Isn't that exquisite? Blood, sweat, tears, I've seen it all. But what I want to know is, when they all moved in, is the dream still alive? Today, I'm returning to this Gothic Revival church in Gamblesby to catch up with intrepid restorers Phil Evans and Joanne McGurr. They loved the building so much, they gambled absolutely everything, remortgaging their existing property to the hilt to raise the £128,000 they needed to buy the church. How big a risk is it, really? We will be mortgaged and loaned, and if something goes wrong, you know, that's it, we, we, we lose everything. But with so little money left to actually do the restoration, the project soon became the challenge of a lifetime. Oh yep. my God, that's a twist off. Ooh, uh, yeah, good. yeah, yeah. The, the whole side is shot. They managed to complete the restoration, but they were left teetering on the edge of financial ruin. We're probably gonna have to sell the place. We've just simply spent too much money. We've spent far too much money. And after all they've been through, the church was hit by a month's rainfall in one day. My God, you've been through it. You really have. I'm just hoping there's a chance they've managed to keep the church as their family home. It all started when Phil and Joanne first saw this late Gothic Revival church in 2010. Nestled in the sleepy village of Gamblesby, which is at the foot of the Pennines, it was built in 1868. For more than 100 years, it served its parish, but for the last eight years, it's lain empty. When it was put up for sale with residential planning permission, Phil and Joanne saw it as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to create their dream home. We decided to come and see it because we've seen it advertised on the internet, and then as soon as we drove into the village, we really loved it. You sit there at home and you look at the TV and you think, I could do that. We're taking a beautiful building. We want to bring it into the 21st century and make sure that it's, you know, that, that the job that we do secures it for another 100 years. The family live 80 miles away and Phil regularly travels to China to sell scientific glass products, which can keep them away from home for weeks at a time. Joanne, also 31, is an accounts manager, but is currently on maternity leave with their three-month-old daughter, Hattie. While Phil and Joanne have done up properties before, they've never tackled a restoration of this size. It's unusual for a young couple with work and a small child to take on something this ambitious. I've come to meet them to find out how realistic their plans are. Hi, you're Mr. Joanne. Nice to meet you. How are you? How are you, doing? Are you well? Good, thank How's you. things? Hello, mate. How are you? You right? Tell me a little bit about what you've bought. Victorian period, um, grade two listed. Um, I, I, for me, I think it's an absolutely beautiful building. We're, we're really passionate about Victorian architecture in particular. And I think whilst it's not you know, the most decorative sort of church you, you've ever seen, it captures you know, nice aspects of, of that sort of architecture and that period. The village setting as well as the building. So the building's really important, but also there's gorgeous buildings everywhere, but it's being part of a community in a village. When we saw this place, it was just, you know, there was no question that it was it's just perfect. Before the project has even started, Phil and Joanne had to make an important decision. With both of them living and working over 80 miles away in Chorley, 
They've chosen to remain in their house while the build is going on, but they need someone to oversee the project. I'm excited. They've decided that their future brother-in-law, Alex, will project manage the whole restoration. Although Alex is a trained architect, he's new to the business of overseeing an on-site building project. He's going to live in the caravan next to the church. Hi, oh, my new home. You've picked the perfect time of year to start the building yeah. project. You know, just kind of coming up towards October, the dark nights, the miserable weather. Exactly. Yeah. And you're going to move into the caravan through the entire winter. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't have planned it better. <laughs> the church is a Grade 2 listed building that comes with restricted planning and building permission. With its 52-foot-high spire, a footprint of over 1,100 square feet, and set in just over a third of an acre of land, this building is full of potential. Well, here we are. Oh, wow. Amazing. Oh, incredible. God, it's a brilliant space, actually. Really lovely. You're going to keep this, yeah? I'm going to keep that, yeah. <laughs> Just make demands to the kids. Stop doing that. And stop doing that as well. <laughs> this area is yep. absolutely stunning. I mean, the fact that you've got this beautiful curve right at the end of the... It's quite unusual, actually. You know, there's not that many churches have got this. Not, yeah, with the, with the Not curve. that many. This building offers fantastic scope for conversion, but I do have some concerns. The church is nearly 144 years old, and I think Joanne and Phil have taken a big gamble buying it without having a structural survey on the roof and spire. Although they've paid for the church outright by remortgaging their house in Chorley, they need to access a self-built mortgage to do the renovation. But the bank won't give them the funds until the building is watertight. With no money left in the kitty, they've had to take out a high-interest loan of £25,000 to do the roof. But I'm worried it won't be enough. Do you have any idea how much this is going to cost you? The basic building, £100,000. £100,000? Yeah. So you said there's some contingency in there, is that yeah. with contingency? No, that's what? without contingency. So what, you got 120 About that bit more, yeah. Yeah. But that's more finished, isn't it? No, no, no. That's, that, uh, we've got a separate contingency, and we've we've got that's to get to the basic building. We've then got a further about twenty-five to actually then do it. You know, kitchens and, and all sorts of things as okay, well. So your budget is one hundred and twenty-five grand, plus a contingency of about twenty. Ten twenty. Okay. So you're one four five. Yeah, but no, we're one two five. We're going to bring in on budget. <laughs> Is this going to be the first restoration project I ever see where the contingency money is never spent? Yes. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> How big a risk is it, Randy? It's, it's everything. We, uh, during this transition period, we will be mortgaged and loaned to the hilt. Um, it's all the equity we've built up over for all the work that we've done over the last 12 years together. Um, and if something goes wrong, you know, that's it. We, we, we lose everything. Phil and Joanne say that their design to convert the church into a dream home came about over a couple of glasses of wine. The plans were then drawn up by Alex. On the ground floor, there'll be a large hallway connecting to a study, WC and cloakroom. This will lead on to an enormous space that will be the main living area that will include a double height dining room, store and a kitchen in the church's nave. On the first floor, there'll be a master bedroom with ensuite, plus two further bedrooms that have their own separate bathrooms. I think the ground floor is spot on. Upstairs, there's a couple of things. You probably can't make the master bedroom bigger because the way the, the, the beams are. I yeah. don't know, but I'm yeah, assuming right, that's yeah. why you've done it. That's exactly um, right. But it feels really small. The dimension on there is 2.8 metres wide. And because it's quite a deep space, it's going to feel very kind of narrow and quite confined. Maybe we utilise some of the spire to create, I don't know, an upstairs library or, you know, like a chill-out area yeah, above yeah. the bedroom. Yeah. I mean, um, obviously, a small space can feel... Bigger if you if you do something with the ceiling. If you lift the ceiling up, a small room can have a, a bigger drama to it. So you're right. You've got the spire above. If you put a little staircase up to there, or you put glass in there, or do something to get Just light to, from the spire down yeah. into that space, it's going I always make with smaller bedrooms to make them bigger. I normally lift the ceiling higher. It's as simple as that. A couple of things you mentioned that were, were sort of new, new ways to tackle the problem. So mm. we're certainly going to take those on board and, and have a look inside the church and just see yeah. what is it, what is possible. This couple have just taken on 
an unbelievable amount. Seriously, they've put everything on the line financially in terms of their time and actually in terms of their quality of life for the next seven or eight months. And they've put so much trust in Alex to deliver this for them. I think it's, I actually think, to be honest, it could be too much for him. I hope it's not, but with all the terrible weather that's gonna come in this part of the world over the next five, six months, and the building being in the condition it's in, I'm just worried that it's gonna to be too much. When I visit site, my earlier concerns about their inexperience are proving true, and I find out they stripped the roof without giving any thought to the weather. Seriously, mate, yeah. I'd get some tarpaulin yeah, up there as quick as you can. Because if the lads are taking that side off tomorrow, like they said they were going to be. Yeah. I mean, look, even the builders would be like, look, it can get wet a bit, it's fine, it'll dry out. It's not great from your point of view if you're going to have damp in there in no, six, no, no, seven no, months' no, time. Good point, yeah, it's a good point. This is a classic example of what you shouldn't really be doing on a build. The weather is going to have a massive impact on this project. And because of costs, they haven't built a big tin roof, a big protector over the top of the church before they strip back the old tiles. They strip the tiles off, and now the water is absolutely flooding in, which means all the pews, this amazing rickety organ and everything, it's just getting absolutely knackered. It's not good. It's a bit late, but Alex finally makes a call. Ah, oh, brilliant. That's really good. Thank you. So it's three, three rolls, 25 by 4 metres, that clear plastic. Right, so basically what we're doing, we're getting um, sheets of heavy-duty plastic, basically, and we're going to try and cover up uh, the whole of the exposed bits of roof, um, just to just try and keep it dry, basically. And then what we'll do is wrap some around the spire as well, just to try and keep it dry, basically. With Alex at last organising the weatherproofing, Phil takes me up to see the spire. But once I'm up there, it's clear that the timber is in a terrible state. Phil, this, this spire's bust, to say the least, isn't it? Oh, yep. my God. Actually, to us, I thought, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a 100 nod year old solid oak. As we peeled it back, we, we realised that this side must have basically taken the brunt of the weathering, and the, the whole side is shot. What are you going to do? What are we going to do? Well, we're still, we're still weighing up the options. Get someone like a good engineer to check it out, to really look at the temporary supports and what it's going to need, because that's going to be really well designed. The last thing you want is to pull out some of these supports and pff, yeah. the whole thing goes. That'd be a disaster for everything. I'm really concerned that Phil's £25,000 high interest loan to fix the roof and spire is not going to be anywhere near enough. If the money runs out, the build will grind to a halt. Although St John's is a humble rural church, all buildings have a history, and I'm intrigued to see why it's been deconsecrated in the first place and planning permission granted to turn it into a home. The local records show that Phil and Joanne's church was built in the middle of Gamblesby in 1868. But what I can't quite understand is the mother church for the area, which is St. Michael's Church, where there's been a church on the site since the 11th century, is only two miles away. With such a small rural population, I can't understand why they built another church so close. The style of our Anglican church may give us a clue. The Gothic Revival architecture consists of a tall spire, lancet windows and buttresses which support the outside walls. This architecture is a throwback to the Church of England's medieval roots and was a reaction to a time of uncertainty when the established Church of England was under threat from new faiths such as Methodism, which were popping up all over the country trying to cater for the new urban masses of the Industrial Revolution. And just looking at this old ordnance survey map of Gamblesby, the mystery of St John's Church is beginning to unravel. Just 50 yards away from our church is a site where John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, built a chapel in 1784. When this humble building was expanded nearly 80 years later, 
the local Anglican vicar felt compelled to respond by building St John's. So it looks like our Gothic Revival Church was built by the Church of England to rival its neighbouring imposter. To find out how the Church of England reacted to the threat of these new faiths, I've come to Oxford, the centre of the Anglican faith in the 19th century, to see one of the finest examples of Gothic Revival architecture, which was built just nine years before our church in Gamblesby. What an unbelievable building. It is so stunningly designed, finished around 1859 by one of the best Gothic Revival architects, George Gilbert Scott. This was one of many churches built through the boom time of 19th century church construction. The Anglican church was feeling threatened by other religions like Methodism. Buildings like this reasserted the Anglican authority. A leading expert in ecclesiastical architecture is Oxford University's Professor Dermot McCulloch. It's such a powerful, strong architecture, isn't it, Dermot? Well, yes, I mean, it's trying to make a statement. The Church of England is the big beast on the block. There are other churches around, but this is the business, and this is the church which has inherited medieval architecture. But, I mean, Catholics, the free churches, the Methodists, they're all now competitors, and the Church of England wants to say, no, we are still the Church of the Nation. And how much would a building like this have cost back in 1859? Well, uh, I happen to know that Exeter College Chapel was £15,000. £15,000. In their money, pounds. of course. It must be one of George Gilbert Scott's best. Yes, just so magnificent Victorian self-confidence, isn't it? We have to say that all the other churches were hugely raising money at the time for their churches. And that's why there was this enormous building boom, I suppose, of the 19th century. Yeah. And it just shows how this architecture really worked. You can see where the money was spent. This is really the Church of England at its most triumphal. Four months into the renovation, the roof is still not watertight and the build is being plagued by horrendous weather. Today is a big day, but the crane that's been ordered to lift the renovated spire to the top of the tower is struggling to get through the road that's blocked by snow. And if that's not bad enough, when Phil came back from a trip to China, he found out that the new spire and roof has cost an estimated 40,000 pounds, which is 15 grand over what he budgeted for. How much have you spent? If I pay all the bills... To date? To date, 75,000, maybe 80,000. I need to, I don't, it, it, obviously there's things happening today, that, you know, things constantly happening, but yeah, 75,000. Yeah, 80 grand, 75 to 80 grand in already? Yes. This spire has knocked us back and taken up a good chunk of the budget. You know, the, well, it's taken up all the contingency and it's eaten into other bits of the budget now. You haven't got the roof finished yet, the slate's not even on, the spire's not even on. You've got to do electrics, plumbing, God knows whatever else. Yep. Fitting floors the lot. And I'll tell you the brutal honest truth, 40 grand ain't gonna do it. No. What are you worried about? Possibly running out of money. I think we are, well, we are gonna run out of money. It's how far we get. How long are you away over the next three or four months? I could easily be probably two to three weeks a month. Two to three weeks a month over the next three or four months? Possibly, it, it, that, that would be the worst case, but that's what, you know, that's, that's what it could be. So when I'm standing here going, you should be here, it ain't going to happen. I'm not unless I can jump on a plane and fly 6,000 miles, no. Although things look really bleak, Phil's pushing ahead. And with the support of his neighbours, they're attempting to get the spire in its rightful place. Brilliant, it's all happening. We've got gritters, everyone clearing, cars out the way, gear out the way. Roof's turning up. What I love about it, it's like all the community, from the farmer next door to the gritty guys to the crane guys, everybody has come together to make this work for the crane today. That's how big a deal it is. The crane has finally got through the snow, but they're now racing against the clock. So we're now at about 20 past three. It's actually a bit lighter than I thought it would have been at this time. We're going to try and lift the spire on top of the frame, peg it out and mark it, lift it off again, put the frame in place, lift the spire on top before the sun completely 
disappears. No chance. I'm all for a bit of optimism. But being a bit delusional doesn't really work on a bad result. <laughs> The lift has to be done in two stages. First, there's the four-ton frame, which provides the support. Then, the spire is lifted and rests on top. We could, actually, we can rotate it as well slightly to get it past the purlins. Let me just cut some more off it. Go on. Agonisingly, the measurements are a couple of inches out. That's it, go on and the team are frantically trying to cut the frame down to size and coax it into place without damaging the 144-year-old brick gable. Paul, that's it, two inches. Go on, go on. That's it, that's it, that's it. And over, that's it. You tight that edge? You tight? Yeah. Yeah, you're clear. You're really tight the side again, you know, Phil. Thankfully, the frame is now safely in place, but fixing the problem has cost them the last of the daylight. We've got the main bit of the frame up on the top, which is fantastic that it fits. Ideally, we'd love to get the whole spire up and drop that on as well. I think it's too dangerous, to be honest. In Cumbria, a second day of sub-zero temperatures has dawned, and another day's crane hire can be added to the cost of putting the spire into place. As he has to work, Phil has left Alex in charge. Finally, the old spire sits on a new supporting structure, but it's come at an enormous price. In the new year, back home in Chorley, Phil and Joanne are really struggling with their budget. Well, the spire meant that we were... we didn't get as much done, which means we've got a limited amount this time to get to the next stage as well, so it's just all having a knock-on effect, isn't it? We're together now, we're having to basically plan, really strictly plan forward now, work, so that we, we only have the right people on site to get us to our next milestone, which is first fix. <laughs> With Phil and Joanne wrestling with their finances, I'm interested to find out how our church, St John's, was originally funded. The records will be here at Lambeth Palace in London. Methodism was on the rise, and when the local Methodist chapel was expanded, it was seen as a threat to the local Anglicans. Gamblesby's vicar, Reverend Brown, decided they should build their own Anglican church in the village. He applied to the Church of England commissioners to fund the building of St John's, but he was rejected twice, and so the Reverend turned to a wealthy benefactor. This incredible document here seems to be a deed, um, which shows, in effect, the transfer of land from the Duke of Devonshire back over to what I think would just be the parish, really. With the land given to them, Reverend Brown set about raising the cash to build his church. So if we look at the Diocese of Carlisle, here we have Addingham, St John, Gamblesby. Finished cost of building, £1,075 and 19 shillings. From what sources were these funds derived? Voluntary contributions. <laughs> £1,075. That's around £49,000 in today's money. That's a significant sum for a small farming community to raise. It certainly shows the passion and commitment local people had to protect their faith. It's February 2011 and I'm back to see how St John's is progressing. After all of that snow and that freezing cold weather before Christmas, We've now got this howling wind and tons of rain. Five months ago, the roof was near to being finished. I'm gobsmacked to see that it's still not completed 
and they've already started building the interior. Morning. Hey, how are you? Oh, it's always good to see the boss back on the side. Thank you. And with a little labourer as well. Absolutely. Hello, mate. How are you? All right. Excellent. All the stud work going on upstairs. You've got all the insulation in. You're starting to batten out up there as well, which is great. You're right, it's starting to feel... I wouldn't quite call it a home yet. But you're starting to understand, you're starting to understand the proportions of the rooms, though, aren't you? Yes. yes. About your ceiling heights and yep. the scale of rooms and how it's all starting to come together. And how it's going to work, how, they, how we're going to use the space. Yeah, the weather hasn't done you any favours, has it? Not None. at all, to be honest. <laughs> so you need to get that roof finished ASAP. Yes, there's that, no point in you doing all this finishing internal. That's the critical path, by far, that stands out. Is, that's the critical path that is the roof. The layout of the master bedroom is going to be a tight squeeze. I want to see if Phil and Joanne have taken on board my tip to use the spire to create the illusion of more space. Up yep. through the bath. Bizarre, but the safest at the moment. So, <laughs> so this is your ensuite. Is that right? In this this is space? the ensuite for the master, yeah. And then this is your master bed space. This is the master bed space. Which is possibly the smallest room in the entire house. But then you look up. And that is unbelievable. Yes, yeah. that's yes. fantastic, man. We took on board what you said, and we're going to create a, a mezzanine, mezzanine floor area. halfway here, so you could actually sit and read and take a look out of the view as well. So, Brilliant. So, in spite of being the smallest room on plan, it's probably going to be the most interesting master oh, no, bedroom no, in, the, in, the, in the county of Cumbria, probably. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that is so three-dimensionally dramatic. With the restoration moving on. I want to find out from Phil and Alex how the finances are shaping up. All right, numbers. Yep. You've got to talk money. Your original budget was the dreaded 125k. Yes. Original budget. What have you been spent so far to date? To date, um, everything we've got here now, 95,000 pounds. 95 grand you spent. Yes. That's everything in, everything on site. Everything on site. All yep. labour, all materials. Yep. Everything. The lot. Yeah, that's pretty good. Have you readjusted your cost plan to face the reality of what's left to do on the build? Or are you telling me you're going to do everything else for 30 grand? That's left. I'm going to try my best to do everything else for 30 grand. Phil's confidence in his completion figure is hugely optimistic. It's vital at this stage to work out exactly what's needed to finish the build. 33, 34, 34 and a half. Let's say it's 35 grand, just for argument's sake. Because mm -hmm. it keeps the maths easier. That means you'll have brought the whole lot in. For 130k, mm -hmm. everything, yeah, finished. <laughs> if you do all this for 135 grand, I'll send you a case of champagne. <laughs> I'm still unbelievably frustrated about so many things on this building project. The fact that it's still not wind and watertight is frankly ridiculous and they're putting all these new building materials inside which are being damaged because there's still water coming in through that very unfinished roof there is a chance that it's starting to turn a little corner there's a chink of light at the end of the tunnel because the budget there's still a bit of money there and the boys seem to be project managing better than they have before the risk for them now is is there enough money left to finish the entire project Five months later, and Phil and Joanne's restoration project is in dire financial straits. Phil is now spending three weeks out of four working in China, and Joanne has had to go back to work to raise funds. Morning, you. You well? Good. Good. So what's going on with the money? Yeah, we had to get some additional lending. Ouch. How much? Um. Another 25. Is yeah. that an extension of your mortgage? Is it a loan? How, it's, a how loan. Big a, it's a loan. Shit. Mm. That's higher interest rates. Yeah. Why can't you just extend the mortgage? At a lower interest rate? Yeah, it's just not it's not something we can do on the property. Because it's not habitable yet. Yeah. That's the bugger, isn't it? That's the one. The bank will only lend or extend when it's deemed as being a habitable home, otherwise it's too much of a risk for them. That's right. And how do you get to that point if they won't lend? It's not a small amount of money. OK, George. <laughs> well, it's not, though, is it? I know. But what can we do? The build so far looks fantastic, but the pressure 
that Phil and Joanne have put each other under, borrowing that extra money as a loan, is just incredible. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Restoration's not for the faint-hearted. With Phil working in China, and with all the budget gone, Joanne's taken over the project from Alex. To raise some cash, she's auctioning off 16 of the original church pews. In top condition, these could be worth a lot of money. The problem is, when they strip the roof off, and the roof was leaking and leaking and leaking and leaking, with water coming in everywhere, some of them have got water damaged as well, which means we're going to get even less money. Right then, 517 is the first of the church pews. Mr Scott points to it, the one at the front here. 24, 26, 38 pounds. It's just a bit annoying, because if every single one of these were claimed to be the standard that way... I'm spitting feathers, just don't even say it anymore, because I'm about to blow a gasket about them weekly. And I've 20 bid. This is you. I've 22 bid for the lot there, then. It's 22 pounds. My right at 22 pounds. By the end of the auction, all the pews are sold, but for only £450. Joanne calls Phil to give him the bad news. They didn't go for as high as we wanted. The auctioneer and various people have said, you know, if they had been a bit cleaner, they probably would have went for more. They would have expected them to get more. Joanne and Phil are just under massive financial pressure now. They've got to make every single penny count and they need to make as much cash as possible between now and the end of the bills. The biggest problem for me is that Phil's away in China, she's off for work and running around all over the world as well. If there's one key golden rule on any restoration project to manage it properly is you need to be there. It's late autumn. And after more than a year of money worries and backbreak and work, Phil and Joanne have nearly finished the church. But unfortunately, they haven't been able to move in yet. There's no doubt about it that church conversions provide some enormous challenges. Many of them are often architectural, but actually for Phil and Joanne, their biggest pressure has been financial. When I was last here in the summer, they borrowed yet another £25,000. I hope it was just enough to get this place finished. Morning. Hey George, how, how are you doing? You? You've lost weight. I have indeed. Look at that thing <laughs> dropping off you. How did you be working hard? That's uh, a good sign. I haven't. It good looks great from the outside. That roof and that spire look brilliant. How do you view it though? I mean, when you look at it, do you think, I love it? Or do you look at it thinking, that just cost too much money and nearly killed the project? Up and down. Up and down. So, some days I arrive and look at it and think, wow. Other times I had to see the. Uh, the, the, the nail in the coffin. You know? <laughs> Don't say that. That makes it sound really bad. It actually it went pretty bad in uh, in July. Um, basically, as we sort of ran out of money, I could see that it could be finished mm -hmm. if the labour aspect was taken out of it. Yeah. Hence the overrun. So basically, I had two jobs, um, split contracts. So I resigned from one of my positions so that I could spend more time up here as Joanne returned back to full-time work. Mm -hmm. So um, in doing that, we picked up pace again. I mean, we've, we, you know, the place really has come on since then. Things have been finished off and, and transformed. But yeah, that's, you know, that's sort of... Yeah, that's you've been busy so, doing other things as yeah. well, I noticed. Yeah, we don't have a TV. Yeah, I love that. You should have stayed in work, mate, because that's going to cost you a lot more money in the long run as well. Yeah. Should we go inside and have a yes. look? Yes, lovely. Look at that entrance hall. I know. Done. Just about done. Don't touch anything because you'll get paint on you. It looks great. Can I go through? Please do. Great. Fifteen months ago, what was a dilapidated leaking church is now an elegant living and dining room. Look at that. I'm actually, um, I shouldn't sound so cynical really, but I'm surprised. With all the financial pressure you've had, I didn't think you were going to do it. The floor is one major achievement. I'm absolutely over the moon with this floor. It's superb. This was bought on eBay, which job lot, drove to London, brought it back, and I had to go through the process of scraping the bitumen off every single block, running it through a table saw twice, through a chop saw twice, 7,000 times. And where the altar once stood has now been turned into a beautiful modern kitchen. Wow, look at that. Amazing. Absolutely fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. When you think you come through that low single-storey height 
and then bang, it just opens wow. up to that roof space. It's beautiful. And, that, and that's just leaving the space alone. Yeah. yeah. You know, just not messing around with it. You're all blessed with a beautiful building. Yeah. You are. I can't wait to see what they've done upstairs, especially in the master bedroom. Oh, it's really lovely. It's really lovely. Do you like it? Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, what a beautiful, romantic, snug, cosy room. Yeah. Right in the top of the building. We've just tried to make it more of a wee apartment. Can I have a look in Phil's den? Sure Is that can. all right? Please, it's boys only. Really? <laughs> what, have you got a little mini bar up there? Yep. <laughs> oh, my word. That's amazing. Do you oh, like it? brilliant. Oh, come on. I mean, that is absolutely fantastic. Phil and Joanne first took up this restoration over a year ago. Their vision and determination to bring St John's back to life has had a powerful impact on the wider community. I went to Sunday school here and I was one of the organists. I think they've done a good job. I think it's very nice. You were the last vicar the last of this church? Last vicar of this church, oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's sad that we can't use it as a church, but great that it's going to still be... Well, it still looks like as part of a community that's no doubt been really well done. In converting St John's into their dream family home, Phil and Joanne have brought the heart back to the village of Gamblesby. But this restoration has left the young couple in a terrible financial position. The bills went £55,000 over budget. In negative equity and under pressure with high interest loans, they've got some serious decisions to make. What are you going to do? We're probably going to have to sell the place. We simply can't afford to service the debt that we now have riding on this place. So we've got a mortgage on this place, we've borrowed from family, and we also have a personal loan each, and credit cards as well. Ouch. Like so many people who take on ambitious restoration projects, Phil and Joanne completely underestimated the scale of the challenge ahead. But through sheer determination and hard work, they have finished the restoration. But the future of the church remains completely uncertain. I just hope they don't have to sell it. So when I last saw Phil and Joanne around nine months ago, they were in a really desperate situation. The restoration of the Lake Gothic Church had become such a massive burden and it left them with crippling debts. This is a couple who sacrificed absolutely everything for that building and I'm hoping they've managed to keep the church as their dream family home. Hello? Well I'm relieved to see they're here and there's a new addition, baby Hugh a playmate for two-and-a-half-year-old Haddie. But the house looks like it's been dressed for a sales brochure, so what's going on? We've managed to keep hold of it. Which is fantastic news. That was the worst-case scenario for me. I just thought, oh, my God, if you sell this, I'd be devastated. It, and it really was the, the 11th hour. I mean, we were literally, like, probably four weeks from running out of everything. Yeah. It, four weeks from direct debits being called drawn down on our accounts and nothing being there to pay them. Everything gone. Every, every single penny that we had. We made three mortgage applications, so one failed and one failed, and then finally we actually got the, the good news and um, we consolidated all that horrible high interest debt that we had, and we've now just got one mortgage repayment instead of all these different things going out. That is such amazing news. I mean, it's still debt, it's still a mortgage, but that's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, but that's it's still not straightforward. We're still, uh, we, we, we're not actually living here. Right. Um, we're going to holiday like the place. The mortgage we've got is too big still for us to move up here. So, um, so basically, if we holiday like the place, we can let it pay for itself, and then in a few years' time, there's the potential for us to, to move up here for good. That's, that's our intention. God, you really did push it, didn't you? Mm. Completely. Holiday rentals of this size in the Pennines fetch up to £1,200 a week in peak times. 
and they've calculated that if they can rent the church out for 50% of the year, they'll be able to cover the mortgage. The couple have been busy dressing the three upstairs bedrooms. Luckily, they're all double rooms and en suite. Perfect for rental. Didn't really plan that initially, did you? No, we were kind of, so much, most of the space upstairs kind of pushed us in that direction. We couldn't find a, a layout with a family bathroom that actually worked for us, so that was sort of, you know, it was, yeah, it was good. It's a blessing in disguise, that, really. Yeah. So since I was last here, a few things have changed, hasn't it? I mean, this has appeared. Yep, I made that. You made it? Yes, uh, it's one of the benefits of working in the chemistry department. They're ripping out the old laboratory bench tops, so I pull them out of the skip and turn them into uh, furniture and things like that. All recycled, all reused. Absolutely, yeah. I'm impressed, mate. That's really, really good. And this area looks great. Little snug, tucked off to one side, nice and cosy. Just separated a little bit from yeah. the main open plan space, doesn't it? Which is really cute. Yeah. They've got all blinds, pictures hung up. And actually, the more you walk through it, the homelier it's starting to feel, isn't it? Yep. You've done loads of work outside, haven't you? Phil and Joanne have spent weeks getting the third of an acre garden beautifully landscaped. But like everything else in this build, even that was a struggle. Uh, we were affected by the floods there in June. Oh, you're joking. Yeah, we actually have some photos. Oh, my word. Yeah. Yes. Look at the state of it. Oh. I mean, that is a massive amount of water. Oh, it's, it's like just... a mini lake. Yeah. When we left, it was a beautiful, luscious green lawn with things that were about to come into flower. When we arrived, we had 0.4 acres of about this thick brown sludge over everything. I mean, we literally left here on the Monday evening and I was thinking, actually, I think I'll bring up some artwork and, you know, maybe we'll be able to start to dress it and next weekend won't be so bad. We'll maybe do a bit of painting and pottering about. But, my God, you've been through it. You really have. The locals called the fire brigade and the fire brigade pumped it out so they were eyes on site because if they had got in, the park and everything would have been gone. When Phil and Joanne began their restoration journey, they believed they could manage the build without really being there. But as they juggled a grown family with work and financial commitments, the reality was very different. Do you think you, um, do you think you learned a lot by taking on too much, by just stretching yourself too far? Absolutely. It was think, harder than we thought, but... Um... I think one of the points that rang in our, our head, or our ears, was... Uh, you need to be on site. You need yeah. to live. Yeah. And my goodness, do you need to live within the vicinity? I think it's the one thing that people get slightly bored of me saying is I'll say the golden rule is be there. Yeah. Just be there. If you're not there, you've got no idea what's going on. No. Absolutely. I think um, we've, we've aged, both aged considerably. <laughs> now. The family plan to move into the church once they've paid off some of their debt. The roof repairs and reconstruction of the spire blew the budget, but it was an investment worth making, as it's the crown and glory of the project. And I can't wait to see that view again. You can see for miles. You can see for miles. I mean, this is this is the payoff, isn't it? Yeah. All the hard work that you did, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears that went into doing all this. Yeah. And you've saved the building, you know. One of the reasons why we fell in love with this building is it is a beautiful building. It does, for me, captures in a, in a sort of modest way all of the nice extravagant bits of, uh, of, of Victorian architecture. The curved end, the, just, you know, the sensible mm -hmm. spire. Not, it's, it's a, it's a you know, completely usual place. And I love the shape of the building, I love the size, I love the, the size of the garden, everything about it. It's just, just right for us. Phil and Joanne have somehow managed to complete this project and realise their dream of owning a restored family home in the country. It really is a great achievement. It's just brilliant that you've not only saved it, but you've kept it for you and your family. But it's been funny, the last few days, or certainly the last few weeks, as I see the light coming to the end of the tunnel, I've actually got quite emotional at the point that I can see my life almost coming back now. I can almost see myself having some spare time. And, you know, the burden of just it constantly on your mind all the time. I can see it almost coming to an end. I feel it's a tremendous sense of relief. I mean, I've, I don't think I've ever met a couple who have literally gone to the wire, the absolute wire financially. You could have lost the lot. Really glad to keep hold of the place. <laughs> There's 
no doubt about it, restoration is one of the biggest and toughest challenges any family could take on. It takes a huge amount of emotional and financial commitment. And when you look at what Phil and Joanne have given to this build, it's been absolutely everything. It literally pushed them to the brink of bankruptcy. They risked everything. But they've done it. They've come through it. They've survived just about with their finances intact. The thing that makes me more happy than anything else is they've managed to keep building.